hard to believe it's only been about 15 years since streaming services exploded in popularity and revolutionized the music, TV, and movie industries, making the way we consume entertainment so much better and so, so much worse than it ever was before. Netflix launched its video streaming service in 2007, the same year Hulu began beta testing, which, I don't know about you, feels simultaneously stunningly recent and like ancient history. The years fly by so fast, don't they? And soon, the grave. But what if I told you the first streaming service actually started an even longer time ago, like in a previous century? Not the 20th century, that's not impressive. That's still only less than a quarter of a century ago. I'm talking about the previous, previous century, the 19th. Specifically, I'm talking about the year 1881, when attendees of the International Exposition of Electricity in Paris, France, were introduced to a remarkable new invention, the theatrophone. Invented by Clement Adair, a French engineer who would soon become far more renowned for his contributions to aviation, the theatrophone used the existing technology of the telephone to enable listeners to remotely enjoy live audio performances. For the first demonstration of the theatrophone at the International Exposition of Electricity in 1881, Adair placed 80 telephone transmitters across the front of the stage at the Paris Opera. The signals from these 80 transmitters were then channeled into two cables, which ran through the sewers of Paris and connected to receivers in a suite at the Palace of Industry, the site of the exposition, over two kilometers away. Each cable carried a separate audio feed, one from the 40 transmitters on the left side of the stage, one from the 40 transmitters on the right, an early form of stereo. The audio transmitted from the Paris Opera stage could be heard by attendees at the exposition through a pair of earphones. The theatrophone was an immediate sensation. Wealthy Parisians loved it. Of course they did. Being able to listen to the opera at home? Rich people love opera today because they erroneously think it makes them sophisticated. It's the same reason they pretend wine tasting is a legitimate and useful practice. So just imagine how much they loved opera in 1881, when there was practically nothing else to do. With the introduction of the theatrophone, instead of having to go to the opera house to be seen by their fellow swells, the members of the high society set could invite each other over to their own houses, where they could sit in their parlors, pretend to have some deeper intellectual appreciation of the wine they were drinking, and listen to the opera. In 1884, Luis I, King of Portugal, had a theatrophone installed so he could hear the opera when unable to personally attend. The technology spread throughout Europe in the following years, from France and Portugal to Belgium and Sweden. Then, in 1890, the Theatrophone Company began operating in Paris, the first commercial theatrophone service. Customers could have theatrophones installed in their homes and, in exchange for a subscription fee, listen to programming transmitted live throughout the day. Coin-operated theatrophones were also placed in public establishments like hotels and restaurants. Fifty centime or half a franc bought five minutes of listening time. That works out, very roughly, to something like $2 a minute in modern American money, which is less than half of what Miss Cleo used to charge. Not bad. Plus, by this time, theatrophone programming was more than just opera. Subscribers and users of coin phones could also hear news programs, weather reports, children's programming, sports results, a wide variety of content presented on a regular schedule so customers knew when to listen in to hear the show they wanted. A few years after the Theatrophone Company began operating, similar services popped up elsewhere. In 1893, the Telephone Hermando, or Telephone Herald in English, was established in Hungary. Though it eventually offered entertainment programming as well, the Telephone Herald began as a news service. Soon other telephone newspapers, as they were called, appeared. Beginning in 1895 in London, England, there was 
the Electrophone, which, similar to the Theatrophone company, focused more on concerts and music hall performances, what Americans of the time would have called vaudeville. Starting in the early 1900s, there were several attempts to establish a telephone newspaper service in the United States, though most only lasted a short time. There was Televent in Detroit, Michigan, which operated from 1906 to 1909, but never got beyond the experimental phase. Two services, which called themselves the Telephone Herald, inspired by Hungary's Telephone Hermann Do, one in Newark, New Jersey, starting in 1910, and the other in Portland, Oregon, starting in 1912, and the Musolophone, which began offering commercial services in Chicago, Illinois, in 1913. The Musolophone system carried a key innovation. The programming was delivered to the audience through a loudspeaker rather than earphones, as with the theatrophone and other telephone newspaper services. Because of this, the musolophone was intended not only for private homes, but for restaurants and other public spaces. And its daily programming included not only news and musical performances, but also live descriptions of baseball games. But, as with the other systems I mentioned, the musolophone never really took off and was forced to cease operations due to a combination of technical, financial, and legal difficulties. If you're wondering what legal difficulties there could possibly have been for a telephone newspaper service, well, that has to do with how the company's programming was being transmitted. Some telephone newspapers, like the original Theatrophone Company, transmitted their signals on their own dedicated wires, which were installed for the specific purpose of carrying their programming. But some companies, like the Automatic Enunciator Company, which marketed the Musolophone, made arrangements with the phone company to use the telephone lines that were already there. This became a problem for Chicago's city telephone supervisor, who thought it might have been illegal for musolophone customers to be charged their subscription fee in addition to the fees they were already paying for regular telephone service, since it was all being delivered through the same wires. Legal counsel for the city of Chicago reviewed the concerns shared by the telephone supervisor and found that the musolophone service was legal, since subscribing to the service was voluntary and all arrangements were done through the Musolophone company, not the phone company, which was charging no additional fees for the Musolophone service. This all seems obvious to us today, but this all happened in 1913. They were still figuring this shit out. The Musolophone was first demonstrated by John J. Comer, who just a few years previously had been involved with another telephone newspaper service established in Wilmington, Delaware. This service, which was started in 1909 by George Webb with Comer as the company's general manager, was called Tell Musicy. What made Tell Musicy unique among the various theatrophone-inspired services I've been talking about is that it wasn't designed to transmit live performances. Tell Musicy was created to transmit pre-recorded content. On demand. I've been calling the Theatrophone the first streaming service, but the overwhelming majority of content on platforms like Netflix, Hulu, Disney+, etc. is pre-recorded. The Theatrophone Company and most other telephone newspaper services only presented live programming, which makes them more analogous to a modern-day live streaming platform like Twitch, but Tell Musicy was different. Here's how it's described in a 1909 issue of Telephony Magazine. Quote, Each musical subscriber is supplied with a special directory giving names and numbers of records, and the call number of the music department. When it is desired to entertain a party of friends, the user calls the music department and requests that a certain number be played. At the same time, the music operator plugs up a free phonograph to his line, slips on the record, and starts the machine. At the conclusion of the piece, the connection is pulled down, unless more performances have been requested. Subscribers to Tell Musicy were charged per request. Three cents for a standard tune, seven cents 
for Grand Opera, but were required to make at least $18 worth of requests per year. Don't you wish Spotify Premium only cost 18 bucks a year? In 1912, George Webb attempted to expand Telmusicy into New York City. He renamed the service the Magnaphone, ditched the on-demand model in favor of scheduled programming, and increased the subscription fee to $8 a month. Why is everything so much more expensive in New York? Is it all the streets? The restaurants? The theaters? The constant palpable and occasionally explosive tension between ethnic groups? The public transportation? Because we've got all of that right here in my hometown of Hagerstown. Except the public transportation. And we won't charge you nearly as much for it. We're usually happy to accept whatever you can afford. We need the money. Is it the heroin? Because we've got that too. Webb also incorporated some live content into the Magnaphone's programming, such as news and sports reports, but the focus of the schedule remained recorded content, transmitting phonograph records along the wires into the homes and businesses of subscribers. The Magnaphone attracted a small group of subscribers, but not enough to survive very long. Tell Music E eventually had over a thousand subscribers in Wilmington, but it went out of business sometime around 1914. In Europe, where telephone newspapers had originated, Telephone Irmando transmitted original programming until 1925, then began relaying radio broadcasts. The Electrophone shut down in 1925. Italy's Telephone Herald, Araldo Telefonico, offered original programming from 1909 until the early 1920s, then began shifting toward relayed radio broadcasts as well. The original streaming service, the Theatrophone Company, shut down in 1932. Following the example set by the Musolophone in Chicago, it had introduced loudspeakers in 1925. It boasted a large subscriber base, at least 1,300 at its peak, including some famous names. Marcel Proust was a subscriber, an avid listener. No wonder it took him so damn long to finish Remembrance of Things Past. Despite all this, by the early 1930s, the Theatrophone's popularity had waned greatly with the rise in the popularity of radio. Listeners of the era decided there was no point in paying for a subscription service when they could get the same sort of content for free in the form of radio broadcasts or by purchasing home media, namely phonograph records. But it's funny how history moves in circles, isn't it? Though the theatrophone and similar systems went away for good, killed off by broadcast and home media, the distribution model, innovated by the theatrophone company and refined by Telephone Hermando, the Musolophone, Telmusiki, and the Magnaphone, would return in the early 21st century with a few additional technological developments and exact a brutal revenge on broadcast and home media as consumers abandoned them in droves in favor of streaming services where, in exchange for a regular fee, subscribers can enjoy whatever entertainment the platform offers whenever they want. On that note, that's pretty much all I wanted to tell you about how people used to listen to opera on their phones. So now, if you'll excuse me, I think it's time for me to sit back, relax, and kick it old school. <laughs> 